we need to order at 431. And if everybody could stand for the pledge, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible. Sorry, Snuck it in real quick before you Okay, so um, the first thing is the acceptance of a gift. Just, it's the public hearing on the acceptance of the gift. So you want to open the hearing? I'm going to open the hearing. And then you can call on Matt. And I'm going to call on Matt. So tell us more about it. <laughs> so, um, per policy, um, any donation that we receive over five thousand dollars, we hold a public hearing for um, any public comments. Um, so, in this case, we um, received a donation of five thousand dollars from the Prime Line of the Hamptons. Um, very generous gift to assist our Seabrook Middle School eighth grade um, with their um, year-end Boston. Um, so you, you can any the public? public comments for feedback on the gift. Okay. And you'll vote to accept the gift later on in the agenda. Okay. So you'll close this public hearing, but they'll you open up a new another. Okay. Public. Well, since there's no comments, we're going to close this part of the public hearing on this gift. And we will move on and open up another public hearing on the withdrawal of funds. Yes, so um, I've I reported the last few meetings um, that we had a um, broken boiler that needs to be replaced. Um, so we have gone through that RFP process, um, and as it was an unanticipated um, expenditure, unfortunately, um, we are. Um, proposing to fund it via the building maintenance expendable trust. Um, that trust has approximately $176,000 um, available. Um, so we would utilize um, six, about $69,000 um, out of withdrawn from that trust um, to fund that replacement of the boiler. So it's the boiler. There's also some roof work that will need to be done install the boiler um, as well as some um, of the controls um, system so it's so it's actually three separate vendors um, we have the um, contractor that we will hear um, be awarding a bid this evening and then Honeywell is the controls and then a roofing company to do some minor repairs or patching rather so again um, any public comments So we'll close that part of the public hearing, and then we'll close it again. Okay. Uh, the next thing is the student representative report. Any? Sorry, spring sports prevent our student rep. Keep them busy. Mm -hmm. um, now we can move on to public comment, so we can open up public comment. Does anyone have any comment on any of the agenda items today? Okay, I don't see any, so we'll leave it open for a half an hour. Uh, middle school math presentation. Thank you. Um, so tonight we're going to take just a few minutes uh, with our math vertical team to just kind of walk the board through some of the updates that we have um, going on in the math department at the middle school. Um, I don't know, Jamie, do you want to say anything sure, to start? Sure, yeah, I'll just yeah. sort of set it up with saying that um, we had conversations all throughout the course of the year with our content experts around the opportunities that we could potentially provide, that we are providing or not providing, um, and that we could provide for our advanced math students. And so um, we began to brainstorm, and over the course of the year, we put together a, a nice sort of proposal or presentation. Um, we're really excited to be able to offer a new advanced math course next year for our seventh grade students. Um, I think we're calling it 7-8 Compacted, which is a real common seventh grade math experience. 
Um, other districts of the SAU use it, other districts in the uh, city of New Hampshire, as really a pathway for our students who are interested and or qualified uh, to pursue an advanced math track. So we're really pleased and excited to offer this to our Seabrook students um, as really a, a way for us to continue to raise the standards and provide them uh, with challenging opportunities. And just kind of looking um, over the past few years, just thinking back on where we started with our math programming, looking at our math program review um, four years ago, and then implementing our Eureka Math K through eight as our next step in making those common standards and competencies and power school and our reporting measures. And so it just now we're at the point where we can fine tune and look at our student achievement at Winnicunit and think about ways that we can offer different pathways here at the middle school to give them, just widen those opportunities for them um, when they leave here. So the math vertical team spent this year um, just really reflecting on our student achievement and also ways we can improve. And one of the things that we, we came up with, similar to what um, Jamie was talking about, is just looking at our, at our scope and sequence of our math competencies across seventh and eighth grade and thinking to ourselves, is there a way to better prepare our eighth graders for algebra one um, in eighth grade, knowing that they still are gonna have that opportunity in ninth grade as well. So we're not limiting a pathway, but we're just kind of opening that a little bit wider for kids. Um, so I'm gonna let the team describe kind of a, a few of these slides, and if you have questions about anything, if you could hold it to the end, and then that way I can, I can kind of pick it up at the end. Alright, so, <laughs> All right. um, so yeah, so just an introduction to what it looks like. So um, we're compacting the 7th and 8th grade curriculums um, into kind of one class, um, focusing on uh, the ones that are going to strengthen them for getting them ready for algebra in 8th grade. So. Um, you know, we're, we're offering kids who are ready for a more challenging and rigorous concepts while aiming for deeper understanding. Um, you know, so it's it's just a it's a higher level of rigor for students, giving them an opportunity to, you know, be in an environment where they can thrive, uh, as opposed to, you know, kind of being present but having to wait until everyone else gets there. And, uh, you know, some kids are ready, some kids are not. Uh, and you know, there's other uh, there, there'll be other opportunities to get into this kind of track when they're ready. Uh, but we're just we're we're starting earlier um, with the idea that we're going to strengthen our group of kids in their algebra skills going into the high school. So this is uh, this is the competencies of the curriculum that we're using. So the seven and eighth grade competencies um, overlap quite a bit. Um, so anything that they miss um, from the seventh grade curriculum will get, you know, will 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 take care of within the eighth grade curriculum, and then we'll have to supplement uh, some of the concepts, um, you know, through an intervention block, as well as, you know, during, throughout the course of the year. Um, so luckily, within the 7th and 8th grade curriculum, there's a lot of overlap uh, in turn, you know, for example, um, you know, working on equations in 7th grade will, will take care of when they're working on linear functions in 8th grade, so kind of front load that. So I, I spoke to this a little bit uh, about the why. Um, I think the biggest thing is, is strengthening our group of you know, students going into the high school, giving them more confidence and, and more depth as 
does maths good. So I've been, you know, I've taught this group for the past eight years, so uh, minus this one. So I, you know, and, and I'm in contact with those teachers up there, so I kind of know what I, I follow up and kind of see that, that track, and a lot of them kind of lose steam as they go. So I think starting, uh, you know, providing this class earlier, I think, I hope, will, will help uh, strengthen that intrinsic value for, you know, studying math. I mean, we want our kids, my goal is that, you know, we have more kids at the high school that want to pursue higher level math. And, and so, you know, providing the algebra in eighth grade, um, you know, that provide, when they get to high school, they're going to have more confidence in algebra two and, you know, more opportunities to, to really pursue those higher level and why we feel it's important. Uh, and being the sixth grade math teacher, I'm Josh Belch, uh, the sixth grade math teacher, I'd be responsible for placing the students that would go into the seventh grade math uh, compacted class. In order to do that, we felt that we wanted as much information, we wanted more data we could use to make this decision better. What we've decided upon was uh, a placement test, report cards, uh, NWA scores, the New Hampshire SAS score, and a basic skills assessment. Uh, and after gathering all this data and meeting as a team, we'll give those names to Mr. Parsons, who then will notify the parents uh, that their child has been selected for this course. So, um, questions from Army right now in terms of anything you heard or I'm just wondering how many do you think that you can have in this track? And how many kids do you think you could successfully boost? Which I love it, by the way. That's not a challenging thing. I just want to say like, I fully support it. Love the idea. I think no, probably no more than 20-ish. Mm -hmm. I think we, we'd like to offer it to all the kids that meet the requirements. So, um, you know, try right. to Yeah, so we're anywhere from 12 to 18, somewhere in there. I mean, obviously, it depends on how many students meet that criteria, but we did look at the, the current group and, and looked at the skills. Some of the, some of the placement criteria we already have. We already have their NEVA scores. We already have the report cards. We already have a basic skills assessment. So we can kind of take a look now and say, yeah, I think we're ready to do that. Um, but I wouldn't want to limit a student um, because of the number. So we're really cognizant student-centered in this process so that students have some flexibility, either students that are on the cusp of, of something that we're really going to be able to take a look at that student because we have multiple measures. We're not, as you take a look at that list, it's not just one, it's not just the report card. We have multiple measures so we can see, we can really refine and look at students that have a strength in one area and maybe need something in another. Um, and so that's going to keep us flexible with students. So we don't want this to feel like a rigid process that limits students. If we have students that are eager and, and want to pursue math, but they need some sort of extra something, we can also provide that over the summer. We can provide that even within the school day in our ice blocks. So we're just, we're hoping that that flexibility is going to allow for some kids to strive because maybe right now they, they don't even know that that exists. You know, so if it, we give them something to reach for, Within that placement process, then we, we might get them to do it. it. Kids that are ready, and again, it's a readiness. We're not limiting students because all students get Algebra One at, at Winniconic. All students, Algebra One's a requirement for graduation. It's something that all, all students are going to be exposed to. So we're not, we're not, we're just moving it a little bit earlier for students that have that readiness. That's, hopefully, that's going to um, encourage them to, to be excited about. I wish we could see it in all the areas, not just math. I think that would be great yeah. in all areas because I think if we keep standards at this level, then we're just we're
we're basically like just like classroom, you know, we're just keeping kids here. And unless they're that motivated kid that's like, you know, I'm, I'm going to go yeah, above it, then we're not. Math's unique in that way because it has that skill set that really those, those skills spiral. Mm -hmm. um, and there's, there's a little bit, it, it's a little bit easier to kind of parse out what skills what sequence in, in like AK described with the seventh and eighth competence in, in standards because there's that overlap. But previously in eighth grade, the teacher that teaches algebra would also be incorporating eighth grade concepts. So they'd be teaching algebra one in eighth grade and the eighth grade concepts. So what we're doing is now we're pulling them across two years in the hopes of get more depth. So when the student hits sophomore year for algebra two, honors, it's, it's, they have those, those skills solidified. So it's the same content, it's just pulled a little bit differently um, instead of just having it in eighth grade. The eighth grade concepts are gonna fill in that in seventh grade. Okay, thank you. Thank you guys. Yeah. Other comments that we, that we're, uh, that we're gonna make? Just comments. kudos to the team. Um, one thing that you guys should know is they brought high school teachers down into this conversation, the whole team did. Um, one of the things we learned through looking at the data was we, we have a placement problem, but we also have a retention problem. So kids that go into the GOH, the honors track at the high school, they're there for honor, GO honors, but when they hit algebra two, as Lauren said, they, they fall short, they, they drop down into the CT level. Um, this particular solution is gonna speak to that, those algebra skills. So yeah, sure, GOH is gonna be great, but when they get hit with algebra two honors, sophomore year, they're gonna have more of those skills to carry with them. Um, yeah, so it's, they. Kudos yeah, we took a four-year look at our, our students up at one time from Seabrook and looked at their placement in math and, and tracked that and found, and, and that's what this is, we're, it's coming from a need um, that we're seeing in our students and we're really wanting to, to address the need. Um, we also, I also um, reached out to Hampton Academy, which is a school that's kind of a similar size as our school and how they do their placement process. <coughs> they sent over some great feedback and some great conversations with them. And obviously, the schools within our district, um, we, got, we reached out to them and found out what their process was. But because they're so so much smaller, we really had to take a look at you know, how we were going to do it here. So we kind of shaped it in the way that we think works best for Seabrook. And hopefully, we can uh, you know we can refine it too and we'll be reflective in that as we get to the end of next year and really take a look at okay, do we need to shift the curriculum? Look at that placement test differently, and we're, we're open to feedback along the way as well. That's great. Thank you guys so much. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Ted Walker. <coughs> <coughs> Quickly, this shows more representation in honors classes from Seabrook in the high school. Yes, it's feedback. sustainable honors. That's what we, the, the opening freshman year is one thing, but then as Dave suggested, um, sustaining that across four years is something that we really want to see students be able to do. Once they start you know, finding their way and finding their passions and interests at the high school, we want to have them have all the opportunities that, that, that they can have up there. There's a lot of fair play to get them back to us. Hold on to that. Awesome. Okay. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. And thank you to the team. I mean, this is really represents, I know that we have two, two people here, but the team is, is there up on the screen. And it's, Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Next presentation is the science. Yeah. Thank you, Robin. Okay, so before we go to that, um, I just want to do a middle school um, update as far as an opportunity for our kids in fifth and sixth grade. So we have. We've been working with SHEA, which is the Seacoast Hampton Estuary Alliance. I think you may have remembered they presented here last year, I think it was. Um, and they put a picture post, they call it, out into our marsh. And they've been working with uh, sixth grade students. And then UNH Extension has been working with our fifth grade students, studying the marsh and the impact of, of um, you know, all kinds of factors on, on the marsh. And students have done a really deep look at where we live and the factors that influence it. We got invited 
to this Coastal Resilience Fair. Um, we have over 20 middle school students attending. It's on Saturday, May 20th. They're working in shifts. They're manning a table. They have posters. Um, they're going to talk about the work that they do, kind of like a citizen science kind of idea where they're out there in the field. Um, what's unique about this is that they're the only students. So everyone else at the fair are adults, mm -hmm. and they all have tables. They're scientists. They're local organizations. And I think it's really important for our <coughs> students to see themselves as contributing to that data, contributing to the, you know, the scientific um, look at our area. And that's what that picture post does. Whenever the students take images off that picture post, it goes into a database <coughs> that scientists use to look at, um, look at the, the Great Marsh, which is what we're uniquely situated on. So um, I just thought that was a real celebration for our science um, teachers and our science department um, to have those kids and all the kids volunteering. It's just the greatest thing to see all those names. <laughs> um, summer school is open for all students in elementary and middle school. Um, if you know people and you're, in, you know, start talking it up, start sending in registration forms or reaching out to me or the offices or homeroom teachers, um, case managers, principals. Um, we have quite a few students already signed up, um, but we're looking for more. It's fully staffed. It's free. We have transportation. We have breakfast, we have lunch, we have activities. It's kind of a blend. It's similar to last year, a blend of academics and social emotional learning. Um, and it kind of dovetails with the work that Brian's been doing with the extra enrichment for the elementary. So there's something that students can be doing on Mondays, on Tuesday, Wednesdays, and Thursday mornings. Um, there's also a bus to the rec department so that students can also participate in that in the afternoons, so similar, similar to what we did last year. We want to fill up those classrooms um, in middle school as well as elementary school. So it's out, and I hope people um, sign up. <coughs> the update for today, I want to start with, with this. And I know that um, on the agenda it says a science. This is something that. Um, Many, many people are talking about in the world of literacy. And it ties directly into what we're doing in the elementary school. Um, I won't get into the details of this, but just to say that what's out in the world of literacy right now is people are talking about what's called the science of reading. It's a way of looking at reading instruction that isn't new. This came out in 2001. It's called the Scarborough's Rope. It's an infographic. It kind of just allows you to take a look at all the components of reading. This is research-based um, infographic that kind of summarizes all the components the students need to see the results in our reading achievement. Because we know when we're looking at reading achievement, it's multiple parts of the rope that we need to take care of. So I just wanted you to see that, because that's the motivation So what we have been working on this year at the elementary school are these curriculum buckets that are now up on the website. So here's our website for the elementary school, and here's the curriculum. And you can go down here, and you can see our curriculum documents. We're very proud of these right now because they're fresh off the, off the um, printing press from our science vertical team at the elementary school and our social studies vertical team at the elementary school have been working all year to create a document for each of those um, <coughs> so part of looking at the science curriculum in the elementary because of an elementary schedule Science and social studies are really integrated into the learning that students are doing during their reading 
during their writing time and at the other times of the day for those field trips or guest speakers. But we really wanted to de describe what that was. What, what are the students doing for units? How are they learning about science? So we got together and created through looking at, in particular for science, we looked at the NGSX, I mean NGSS standards and used those, our national standards for science, and created essential questions, created our thinking habits, our belief statements, and then took a look across grade levels and described and defined what the units are going to be from kindergarten to fourth grade, fall, winter, and spring. This is huge. This is huge because now we have a place where we know students are going to learn, let's say, for instance, the engineering drop in third grade in the fall. We know third graders are going to dive into that project and it's going to be language rich and it's going to be lots of opportunities for them to have hands on learning. Again, I'm, we're thinking reading achievement, right? Because all of that experience with language, all of that hands on and internalizing of knowledge is what makes them proficient readers. So look at all the opportunities they're going to have to create that background knowledge from this map. So they're varied. It took long, 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 many, many hours for the team to, to, to kind of parse out where they were going to land on these science units. And now the work of rebuilding them and, and kind of actualizing them. They have lots of ideas, and much of it is underway. But this is really a, a great way to, for, for us to, to get, get our um, get organized with how we see our science. Um, right, and then we have our social studies one, which we've done as well. And that's the difference with the teacher at the elementary school. It's the social studies vertical team. Each of the members of the vertical team just made these documents and then went back to their grade levels and shared them out with their other members of the team, hashed them out, refined them, and came back and gave. So every teacher in the building had feedback from these documents so that everybody has, you know, in, is invested in, in the end product. So again, we did the same exact thing. So same format for social studies, different, obviously different thinking habits, different essential questions. And then here's our map, which is the longer pathway, so that we know the students are going to be exposed to all of this rich content, all of these great experiences. These lend themselves to thematic learning, where the kids can go on field trips and we can have guest speakers. And, and we're doing some of that right now at the elementary, but now what we're doing is describing it. And we're actually mapping it <coughs> and, and committing ourselves to to the work ahead. So that is a chance to put these up here. This is our English language arts competencies and standards. This is on our website now. It describes basically the report card, what parents see on the report card, but in sequence, and kind of the progression of how our skills and competencies can start in kindergarten and they you know, move their way into fourth grade. And kind of a little bit about our philosophy around literacy. on how we teach literacy, and then there's another one for math, so that we can see kind of the big, big view, which is those competencies. And then the units play into those um, in the other documents. So those are all up there for everyone to read some night when you want something that's not very casual. <laughs> um, <laughs> not what I get excited about, but that's OK. Um, so that's up there. And the last. I do want to invite everyone to um, this family concert. 
So we do have an artist in residence, and he's coming the um, next week, the 15th to the 19th. And he is also a, an author, um, and he's going to give a, a whole school uh, presentation on Monday morning for all K-4, and then he's going to work with fourth graders in particular all week long on whales and studying the study of whales and how it connects to sound and music. And she's got a fantastic week ahead for the kids. But what's really fun about it is that he's integrating into Katrina's music class and all the kids are going to have been learning songs and they're going to sing them with him and all his instruments um, Friday night, May 19th at 5.30. All are welcome. Even middle school families are welcome. You're in, in Seabrook, all Seabrook families are welcome and it's free. So I hope that you can bring your kids. Um, I think it'll be really fun. He's a great presenter and performer. He's performed all over the state, New Hampshire and the country uh, as well. So come on Friday, May 19th from 5.30 to 6.15. It's free. Come on in and enjoy some music and, and some of our kids singing uh, old shanty songs and all the fun wow. stuff of whaling. <laughs> and it's going to be really fun. So I hope you can join us. And that's it. Thank, Thank you, Lauren. you. I just want to respond to that. I just want to give a shout out to Mr. Small and Ms. Christian only because I have direct interaction with them because my child is in their class, but they are really doing all the things you mentioned. And I feel like every day she comes home and I'm like, I baked a rock today and I <laughs> did the, this with the Abenakis and I built this yes. Minecraft thing and like constantly coming home with doing things and she's telling me all these facts that she's learning. So Isn't that great? It's working. No, it's so it's wonderful. That's great to hear. Yeah, yeah the teachers that. are really digging in. And the in for instance having this month of theme the the whales for the for the month of May, just having that common theme that everyone looks at kindergarten to fourth grade all together. But at obviously a different varying uh, developmental spot. I mean it's just fantastic. We had an author zoom in, uh, Michael Gotro set up a author Zoom call this week or the last last week, K two and three four. You have it in your board report. I'm going to steal your thunder. Okay. And so what she did was um, she reached out to a, an author of a children's whale book on Facebook, and that author got back to her and said, "Not only am I an author, I'm a I'm a scientist in Alaska and I study whales." And Michael Gotro said, "Well then, zoom in to our school because we're studying males whales for the month of May." So she did. And it was amazing. It was wow. She she did a K two and a three four Zoom call, where she was up in Alaska and we she pointed her camera outside. We saw water. She described all that she does with. I mean, it was just this great. And the kids, because of their connection to the content, they were then able to connect to this person. And that's how it grows. So if, if a student learns one small thing, it, it tends to to grow. Mm -hmm. Right, so now they have another thing to attach an idea to, and another idea, and another one. And when they see a movie, and they read a book, or they run in, it's going to build. Mm -hmm. They'll know more about whales than you know some of the people that study them at the end, right? So that they can grow those ideas. So it's just, did you learn about a whale's <laughs> um, bathroom habits? Oh like, yeah, that they love that first. That was what the second grader came home and shared yeah. with me. Yeah. <laughs> So well, it's, you know, what they get from it, who knows, but it's coming. It's, it's coming. No, I know, I know. Well, they do tend to start with those questions, but that's yeah. all right. Of course, of course. Well, no, I would definitely okay. second what Christina would say, but I, I, my kids have been coming home every single day. They're excited to learn stuff. Like, like we talked about all like, You guys have done a great job. Mr. Small's class, again, I can only speak to that. He's in it. Learning fractions via cooking this might be one of the more brilliant ideas I've, I've heard of and Calvin will tell you that he will mess up microwaving a uh, mac and cheese cup but he's like won three of the baking competitions over in the class and he is super thrilled that's learning stuff in between so fun all the stuff you guys have done outside but it's always something new here and I appreciate it and, and yep, you guys thank are doing you. a great job thank you thanks Lauren thank you it. Um, we're going to close public comment at 5.07. Next is approval of the minutes. Can I have a motion for that? I make a motion to approve the minutes. On the April 11th? On the April 11th. I can't follow the computer's dead. You can follow along. Yep, from the April 11th regular meeting. Okay. I'll second. All 
system when you yeah. write yeah report, so it's more sophisticated yeah. and harder to catch now right mm -hmm. so I think the other pieces the other thing I would say is as a writing teacher I was compensated with my kids pretty regularly so I knew how they wrote on a day-to-day -day basis mm -hmm. um, and we wrote in class and so I had a sense of who they were as writers and so when I would get a paper that felt like it had been written by somebody else somebody right probably it probably was so <laughs> I think like that like you said, the, times are changing. They want something that you'll never have a calculator in your pocket, so you have to do it all by hand. Yeah. Once yes. again, years of academy so, training wasted. Yeah. So I, I think it is important for us to understand it. And Dave will talk a little bit. We're you know going to do a little bit work of work with teachers around how they can use it in their own professional work. Um, I think it does provide a lot of opportunities, but I think we also have to be really cognizant of the teaching and learning that's required to use the tool responsibly. Yeah. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Now, Dave, your feedback well, on I guess AI. I've been out. Um, <laughs> just 
Uh, with respect to the chat GPT, um, that is a thing that's going on at Williams County High School. They've used Title II dollars to actually uh, create a Williams County University course, they call it. It's just professional development. Um, they're a tech integrator, um, ways to use chat GPT as adults to help your teaching. Um, so they're having some really good discussion. I think Meredith's right. Like, there's, there's an easy kind of posture to say no way, um, but we're going to have to learn about it. We're going to have to uh, embrace it in responsible ways um, because our kids are definitely um, all over it. Uh, so from curriculum, uh, SAEY, there's three updates from me. One um, is the Gallup survey and development of career pathways. As you guys know from Forge with the Learner work, uh, career pathways is going to be a big push throughout the SAU uh, for the next number of years. Um, the Gallup poll is being administered mid-May, I think May 15th, uh, at Winnicott High School. It's an academic poll, um, but it, what it looks at are students' perception of career pathways within the high school. Um, so um, their perception of avenues into different work areas of the workforce, um, and we're going to be using that as baseline data with respect to the portion of the learner work. Uh, uh, in other words, where we can improve and where we're doing really well uh, in terms of getting out into the community. And so we're excited about that. Uh, look forward to crunching the numbers. Two is competency reporting and curriculum review. Uh, Lauren did talk about some of the math work they're doing. Uh, one of the other things we've been working on are creating custom reports within PowerSchool. I wanted you guys to be aware of this. Um, so what we can now do at the SAU level <laughs> and district levels as well is um, take a given standard and a given competency um, and actually uh, calculate how many times it's been assessed across the SAU and how well kids are doing based on standard or based on competency across the SAU. Um, it's going to be a really good tool for move when ready, for students moving when ready, uh, for challenging students, but also for professional development for our teachers. If we see one standard or competency in a given class uh, really deficient, uh, we can start uh, building priority behind that. Uh, so we're excited to get that off the ground and start playing with that data. And lastly, it does not require an explanation. Uh, New Hampshire SAS, the statewide testing is happening like now, like today. Uh -huh. um, so you guys will all hear about that from your kids. One thing that is important to note, though, is um, they do have the um, online portal now. So as soon as students take that test and get their results, uh, we'll communicate with you how to log on to the online portal, uh -huh. and you can get a full individual student report at your whim as parents. Um, and I'll and that's the that. one that comes home and says, like, they're doing better than X amount or the same as X amount of people. It's like a, yep. it's like a packet that so, gets sent back. Exactly, it gives quantitative and qualitative descriptions of what, how, how well they did and where, they're, um, where they need work. Great. I just want to add to that, all the parents, um, both elementary and middle school, were mailed home a letter that um, earlier in the year that has the login to that portal because each oh. student has a different login. Oh. So it's very unique to the family. So it came with a report card, um, so that was T2 report card March 17th somewhere around there with the actual too. report card or was it with the other it, we did a mailing for all this for all the families and in that envelope had mm -hmm. so it back and if you mm -hmm. if you need it, you know we have copies of those so we can certainly do that yeah. um, go but that, that'll help you get into that okay. portal great thank you yeah, thanks. Thank you. good evening everybody nice to see you I have a brief presentation Report. But before I do that, I have an update for you that's very, very new, hot off the press. You'll recall that we brought to you the good news about receiving the planning grant for us to undertake this full service community school planning opportunity. And with that, we had a job description for coordinator for that planning program. And Brian and I knew that we were looking for a unicorn out there in terms of um, what it is that we needed in a, an individual. And I'm really happy to say that Brian and I put a committee and interview committee together. Um, we had a posting. We had four candidates. We um, decided uh, to interview two of them were worthy, and um, we're so pleased that we found this unicorn. And so Dr. Megan Fitzgerald Raimundo, um, who was recently uh, relocated back to the Seacoast area, um, is very thrilled, calls this her dream job. She has a doctorate in curriculum and teaching and early education policy from Columbia University at New York Teachers College there. She has been an assistant professor tenured um, most recently and also was an early childhood instructional coordinator in New York City Department of Education. 
while she was in Fresno, California, back when she was a teacher, she was involved in their full service community school program and launching that through the Fresno Public Schools there. And so she brings a wealth of information. Her references are outstanding. We feel really fortunate that she's willing to take this on and she's very confident with her um, ability to coordinate uh, resources, agencies, and partners in order to get us this much bigger multi-year grant that we're looking for. So that's the news hot off the press. We're looking forward to having um, Dr. Fitzgerald Bernardino join us beginning July 1. So we'll bring her so she can you know, do that as we go forward. So you're saying unicorns are real? They are. <laughs> they are absolutely <laughs> real. I encourage you all to believe in it. <laughs> absolutely. Uh, so superintendent asked me to share with you a little bit about the special education LEA determinations. They come out from the DOE every single year. So hopefully this is going to work for us. There we go. Um, and they're required, um, you know, by law, by the statute, in terms of um, us accepting funding from uh, Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. And these are annual determinations, and they're based on the performance of how well each public school district is doing, related to the regulations of IDEA and how we're, we're meeting that. So we look at all the requirements, we look at the school performance indicators, and then those areas make up the determination rubric. Uh, there are four categories of determination, and the first one is NEETS. That's what, you know, what we're all striving for. The next one is NEETS assistance. And the third one is needs intervention. And then the last one is needs substantial intervention. And the way this works, it's like a game of golf. The fewer points, the fewer strokes, the best in this rubric. So I just wanted to explain that to you and show you a little bit about, about the rubric here. Um, so you can see that to get needs, you have to have no points at all, 0% of the points, up to 38%. And then the categories go from there all the way down. Uh, there are four different categories and indicators with each of those categories, starting with results-based. And those would be things like for the high school, graduation, dropout information, educational environments. For us at this level, it would be about preschool environments. It would be about all educational environments. How are we doing with inclusion practices? How's our parental involvement? All of that. The most points that you could achieve there is 18. So, you know, zero out of 18 is best but they only score you on the areas, on the indicators that are assigned to your particular level of school. So we wouldn't be scored on dropouts or graduation here. The second category is in assessment. So not only do we look at the actual assessment results for students who have uh, special needs, but we look at their participation. Are they participating in the state testing that we were just talking about? Um, then we look at their proficiency, we also look at gaps. Is there a gap between students with disabilities and without? What does that look like? And how about students who are taking an alternative assessment, an alternative to the state test? And so that would be out of a total of 26 points. We look at that. Then the third category is all the compliance areas. Suspension they look at. Um, they look at disproportionate representation. How are our child find efforts? And that's, we've been talking a lot about child find with our um, early intervention work and also with this full service school grant that will now allow us even earlier than two years, nine months to start looking at children from birth on. Um, early childhood transitions into from preschool to kindergarten, from kindergarten into first grade, um, and obviously we wouldn't be scored on secondary transition here. So out of 10 points, how many uh, are, are we getting there? And then finally, the last category is additional factors or other factors. That's about how well we're doing with our grants, our submission of our data, are we, do we have any uh, complaint allegations? Is there administrative turnover? All of those things out of a total of eight. We get an overall score. So we get an overall determination for all of it. They combine all sections. And then you can see what the overall determination is depending upon how many in each category you receive. And then you receive a score for each category in addition to that. And that tells us where we're going from there. So the next slide shows you the Seabrook LEA determinations for the last two years. Now, the thing to understand is that the 22-23 determination that just came out recently in April, most of that data is taken from last school year. So they have to wait till they get all of the data from the year before, and then they compile it and they give us our determination, most of it. And then you can see the 21-22 is actually most of it from the year before. 
But just to compare where we are, in 21-22, we received an overall of NEETS, and for 22-23, that was reduced to uh, needs assistance. So uh, things for us to be looking at. Under results-based, um, in 21-22, we did have a NEETS, and that moved to uh, needs intervention. So that one is, is the most serious here. And then under assessment, it stayed the same on needs assistance. Under compliance, stayed meets, so that's excellent. And then under the additional, it stayed meets. So the areas that we need to work on are everything around the results and everything around assessment. And so what will be happening now is that um, the Bureau of Special Education under the DOE will be providing us support and assistance um, for any of these areas, and they have lots of resources for us to tap. And I will be working closely with the uh, Special Services Director here to look at each of those indicators in depth and look at the specific criteria and what we can do to ensure that for next school year, um, the data that we're putting together for this year will help us improve. If you have any questions, I'm happy to take those for you. Very much. Okay, thank, thank you. you. <coughs> All right, Brian. All right. Well, thanks so much. We're doing a great job explaining the, the whale mobile, but I do want to just recognize one thing. Uh, we have a number of big hands-on experiences this year, and Lauren's been pivotal in pulling things together, whether it's grants or working with Michael in the library. Uh, so just want to say thank you to Lauren for that. Um, our our I reported this month is a lot of things that um, Lauren has taken the lead on. Including the Wheelmobile, uh, we did have the author visit with Shelly Gill, which was uh, organized by Michael Beltro, who's the author from Alaska. Um, and White Pines is our outdoor adventure, um, where we've had a number of students and every day that we'll go outside and learn how to just be part of nature and explore the campus. Uh, our school campus is beautiful. We've got ocean on one side, we've got the woods on the other side, and there really isn't much in New Hampshire that we don't see here. Uh, and we're going to see this area, so it's really exciting. So you'll see that, and then there's also a wellness project that we worked with Laura on, where we brought in um, uh, a wellness coach who's been part of the Unified Arts schedule this year. We hope to continue with some capacity next year. Um, and what that is, it's been really teaching kids about how to understand themselves and kind of understand their body and how to calm themselves down. Uh, and so we've had a really um, uh, good turnout for uh, community police law and bringing my mindfulness and development into the classroom. Um, also, I uh, want to thank our PTO. Uh, this week we did kick off testing, but we started that uh, on Monday with 200 kids in the cafeteria eating pancakes, bacon, and eggs that were donated by the PTO on a local farm. And we actually kicked off with maple syrup at our school <coughs> uh, So it was kind of a whole community event. Uh, Mr. Dow, Mr. Han, uh, Lindsay Gosher, our food service director, and uh, Siobhan, who's our chef, uh, were outside for an hour making. 200 pancakes and 20 pumpkins of bacon. We still smell like bacon today. <laughs> um, but it wouldn't have been made possible without the support of everybody kind of coming together um, and reminding our students that we're just cheering them on. Testing is a part of life. It's a part of what we do. We want them to just do their best and not be stressed about it. And um, it was really, they got this, we're, we're hatching eggs right now. We've got a, like a farm connection too right now. And so students are really kind of seeing everything come together. Um, and that's one of the things really about giving them exposure to some of these things. Um, another shout out that's not on our report, which I'll report more on next month. Uh, we're working with SAS right now. Today we had 36 students out in the community doing club. So I, I went and visited 12 kids dancing. One of the girls comes running out of the <laughs> and she was so proud of herself. Um, I was getting text messages from um, another group who's doing karate here in Seabrook. And so there's 12 students and students who were just having a blast learning something new. And then we had 12 students at a Tiny cottage in Seattle, in the middle of the woods, filled with fairy houses and chasing chickens around. Coolest experience. And so we set up six week sessions so that uh, the students can make it through it. Um, nice sports to be a flexible. Last night we only had three kids sign up. We have probably had 12. That's awesome. Late awesome. last night getting, mm -hmm. getting some kids registered. Um, and it's really just about showing them what's out there mm -hmm. uh, and having them be a part of something. Um, so we're going to come back at the end of the six weeks and the kids are going to show you some karate. Some
think, and, and, and not to jump in the middle of your thing either, Brian, but what's really important, I think the point goes, it's not just for SAS kids. Mm. It's actually open to the whole school. We're the filter. Mm. That's it. And that's the essence of it right there. So every we've got a bunch of students that are not in SAS that were there today. And it was wonderful. It was, it was great. It really, I got to drive a lot today. <laughs> so, but I'm going to tell you, it was like the SAS party bus. I've got these kids singing in the back, and I'm like rocking out. So this the whole experience of it is absolutely it really is. And Brian, all I did was say yes. Okay, we organized some of the, the transportation. <laughs> you did this. This was this is awesome. And I, I don't have 36 million members. So <laughs> sure. We've got many styles and different things. Most of you have time for the clubs and the things. The whole idea when we work with trainers, I want to get back to the essence of why we have the session is for and to get the learning goals. I love that. So I've got my daughters in the next car. Watch out. <laughs> 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 or something. We didn't have girls on the run, at least one two of the children, my children, would be in one of those things doing that stuff. But I think that's awesome. And what a great challenge to have. Opportunity, right? Yeah. All these different choices. That's right. Sounds, that's that's the terrible. Now, so that's 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 some business out there. I don't know what we're doing over there. So that's, that's really awesome that you guys are doing that. That's really great. So thank you, Brian. Thank you. Thanks for us. Um, Jamie. Sure. Um, just want to start uh, by expressing on behalf of the eighth grade uh, team and class our gratitude again for the generous donation from the uh, Crime Line folks for the Hamptons. Uh, it was a great donation and really just really proud of in general how, how much um, eighth graders have worked to raise funds for this trip. Um, just really did a great job. Um, this past Wednesday we went on a full school field trip which was Stressful. And <laughs> the entire building um, basically loaded onto buses first thing in the morning, and we drove 50 miles to Manchester for the um, <clears throat> Fisher Cats game. And as soon as we got there, it downpoured. Um, I heard it was an awesome time. But, That's uh, right. Oh, so my kids had a ball. That was my that was my impression in here. It didn't dampen the spirits of the kids. Uh, at all. It was uh, and it was it was really funny. Uh, Mr. Bombardier and I, I think we felt like we were on an extended lunch duty. <laughs> With the rain, there was this concourse area, so it's covered. Yeah. Um, and so all the kids, most of them left their seats, and it was like a crescent shape. Down on one end, there was like a bouncy house oh, and some of these God. other activities that they could do. And then there were all these vendors along the way, and so it was just this constant flow of kids going <laughs> yeah. back and forth. Um, and, but they, they did, our kids did awesome. I mean, they, they had smiles on their faces. They were getting uh, Fisher Cats gear, sweatshirts, came up to me and said, look at my sweatshirt, it only costs $30. Because <laughs> <laughs> well, they left okay. theirs at home. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They no, left they left theirs at the wreck. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, there was, there, was, there was dipping Dots, you know, you could get a little oh, yeah. Fisher Cats yeah. hat at Dippin' yeah. Dots for 10 bucks. Yeah. Um, 10 bucks. <laughs> <laughs> Cam goes, I didn't buy a laser this time. I'm like, good, you've got a whole toy box full of those things for 50 bucks. Yeah, it was funny. I, I was holding an umbrella, and a fifth grader came up to me and looked, pointed at my umbrella and said, is that yours? Can I use it? Sure. Thank you. Nope. I'll give you this. He handed me a lightsaber that he had bought. That's a nice trade.
basically providing a, a space, a quiet space for kids to access on uh, Mondays, Tuesdays, and Thursdays. Our staff has been uh, great with supporting that. We have Ms. Wilk and Ms. Sousa on Tuesday, uh, Mondays, Tuesdays, and Thursdays. Um, and we have Mr. Felch, Ms. Escanio, Ms. Sherbon um, on Tuesdays and Thursdays. So in addition to SAS, if, if students are interested in accessing a quiet space to do their homework, uh, get caught up, uh, we do have those available um, almost every day after school. Um, and then let's see, last Thursday it was really uh, an interesting, uh, rich, authentic presentation that was uh, given by uh, Sudanese refugee Peter Niani. Uh, there was, uh, our student seventh and eighth graders were in the gym to watch a documentary film, short film, about 17 minutes long, uh, chronicling uh, the life of uh, Peter, who now lives in New Hampshire. He fled war torn Sudan. He was, you may remember, in the early mid 2000s, it was the Lost Boys of Sudan. And we had, um, I know, at my first teaching job, we had, um, I think, three or four uh, Lost Boys of Sudan. So um, it was a, a great opportunity for our students to experience um, his life experience. They were able to interact with him and, and ask him questions. Um, so it was a really great experience uh, for them. And I'd like to thank Mrs. Tony for uh, bringing him uh, to Seabrook Middle School. Uh, just an announcement about the eighth grade semi-formals coming up on May 19th um, at the Ashworth. Everybody is really excited. Um, please don't go out and spend tons of money uh, on, on outfits, uh, but students are already really excited about their dresses and things and um, their formal, semi-formal wear. Um, so that's coming up. Also on May 19th, the same day, it, at school here, we're excited to announce the return of the Walter C. Burns Fishing Derby uh, for our special ed students. We have some of our special ed students along with some student leaders uh, that will be uh, going to this, um, I forget what town it's in, um, but it's, it's pretty close by where there's a, a fully stocked pond, so kids will get an opportunity to get outside and practice fishing. Um, and hopefully catch some big trout. Um, and then also we all know that our eighth grade overnight trip is coming up on uh, May 23rd through the 25th. Um, the itinerary is attached and it's exhausting just reading the itinerary. <laughs> uh, you'll have a blast. That's, awesome. That's all for now. Yeah, uh, Mr. Bombardier is going, I'm going to be up with them I think for the dinner first. Solid, yeah. solid idea. Right. Yeah, you just come right for the dinner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Come on, smell it. Well, that's great. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you. Matt. Thank you. So attached, I have included um, the two monthly reports, uh, fiscal year 23 um, expenditure and revenue reports. Um, so on the expenditure side, uh, we are currently tracking um, to end this fiscal year, um, having expended all of our available general funds. Um, this is due to um, operating under a default budget as well as um, a significant um, special education cost. Um, I'll, you'll note on the report it actually indicates a negative balance of approximately $50,000. Um, however, that does not account for um, roughly $40,000 that we will be credited um, for bus transportation refunds. Um, that being said, that's only one side of the picture. That's that's the uh, expenditure side. On the revenue side, um, we are um, we, we have received um, significant unanticipated um, um, surplus revenue. Um, so currently, we have approximately one hundred and forty thousand dollars in unanticipated revenue. Um, so assuming there's no significant changes on either the expenditure or the revenue side, we are projecting to finish um, this fiscal year with roughly um, $75,000. Um, and, and that would, that $70,000 would be the unreserved fund balance that would then be returned to the town um, to offset property tax assessment. Um, I'll also note that should there, there be any significant changes um, between now and our June board meeting, um, we could potentially also I don't want to anticipate the need for that. I'd be happy to answer any questions in regard to the budget. Mm -hmm. It's working. <laughs> it's a lean you. year. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Mark. Work, yep. Okay, continuing business. 
There is none. There is none. Shrek. Oh, no. Sounds great. Okay. I'm going to stand for that. Policies first read. So we have 22 policies on here. 12 of them are updated, refreshed policies. Uh, the other 10 are recommended for withdrawal. These are all, or I think all, all but one in the I section, which is your instruction section of your policy manual. Um, we're about halfway through that section, but mm -hmm. remember the policy committee is working its way through. Um, we've done all the required by law policies. These are the recommended policies. So um, those that are recommended for withdrawal, like for example, bomb threats, is already incorporated into emergency center. Mm -hmm. So it's an extra policy that goes back probably 20 years at this point. Um, and that is true for, for most of the builders as well. So happy to answer any specific questions. Otherwise, we will bring them back here next week. Sounds good. Okay. Anybody have questions? No. No. All right. Um, now to make a motion for the withdrawal from the building trust. Make a motion that we withdraw $69,000 from the boiler. Withdraw $69,000 for the building trust. The boiler And make the motion that we file the motion that's on the paper. <laughs> I'll second. Yeah. We're going to find it. <laughs> All in favor? You're, you're good. Any opposed? No, unanimous. All right. Next, I need a motion to accept a very generous gift from the Prime Library of Upton. Make a motion to accept a donation of 5000 from the Prime Library of Upton. That's a nice free gift and we need a to make the trip. I'll second. All in favor? No. Okay, then we have another gift uh, from Home Depot. Sounds like another very generous gift. Yeah, so it's both from Home Depot and SAS, but it's $4,000 oh. worth of supplies and materials as well as some volunteer time nice. um, to work on our nature trail, the Disney nature trail. I make a motion to accept the donation. Thousand supplies and materials. From size number <laughs> 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 Real fast. All the numbers. All second. Oh, battle. All in favor. Okay. Award of bid for the Chromebooks. So the bid process has concluded for the annual Chromebooks purchase. Um, bids were sent directly to seven vendors and seven submitted bids. Um, I will note that there were three um, bids that were disqualified uh, for not meeting the bid specifications. Um, so the administration is recommending award bid to Connection for the amount of $30,742. That is for 80 Chromebooks. Um, and that will be coming out of the 23-24, um, so next year's operating budget. Okay. And we got a motion. Make a motion to award bid to connection of the amount of thirty thousand seven hundred and forty two dollars for eighty Chromebooks. One second. Oh, never mind. All in favor. Okay, the next bid for the kitchen equipment. Um, so the bid process is also concluded for the kitchen equipment. Um, and this is part of the surplus spending plan that we put together um, for the food service account because and there was a surplus balance. Um, so bids were sent directly to six vendors and two bids were received. Um, I will also note um, there is, um, you know, when looking at these bids, um, the specifications that we had put out had, um, had been for a, a model oven that is no longer um, being sold. So. Um, due to availability um, and the newer model version, um, we did have to work, negotiate through these bids um, after the fact, um, which is per our procurement um, regulation. Um, I just want to note that because the, the final number is actually less than the, um, than the original bid amounts. Um, 
So we and we did um, we did select central restaurant products. So we are recommending award to bid uh, for them in the amount of one hundred and twenty four thousand and fifty four dollars and ninety four cents. Um, I the the bids were essentially the same. I think it was a like a thirteen dollar difference mm -hmm. um, in price. Um, so our I, I just want you to be aware that the, the reason we selected central restaurant over the other it wasn't a pricing because it was actually the thirteen dollars more mm -hmm. that that was central restaurant it's because of the lead time so mm -hmm. they could deliver the products five to six months prior to um, Douglas and Whitney that's worth mm -hmm. thirteen dollars yeah <laughs> seriously um can I get a motion to award them thank you Patrick um, <laughs> I will make a motion to award the bid for kitchen equipment to Central Restaurant Products in the amount of $124,000, I'll second. All in favor? No. Okay. 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 Now the playground fence. Thank you. Um, so we'll continue with the bids with the uh, proposed fence project. Um, bids were sent directly to seven vendors. Two attended the walkthrough and two submitted bids. Um, this project is being funded via the SAFE grants. Um, and um, so this was one of those, um, those projects that we had applied to the state and were award bids. Um, and we are recommending award bid to Atlantic Coast Defense in the amount of $29,649. So uh, this is, there's another just um, note on this bid. Um, we received, or we were awarded slightly less than $29,000 from the SAFE grant. So we will be working with the vendor to um, look at the scope, see if we can reduce any costs to get below that threshold with a couple thousand dollars to get to that number. If we are confident that we'll be able to do so, however, if not, it'll be funded, that, that difference of a couple thousand dollars will be um, supplemented via the funding. Okay. But we're, we're pretty confident um, that we'll be able to get there. Do I have a motion to award that? Make a motion to award a playground fence, fencing bid to Atlantic Coast Fence in the amount of $29,640. All in favor? Unanimous. And the last bid. And that is for the boiler project that was discussed during the public hearing. Um, bids were sent directly to 10 vendors, five attended the walkthrough, and four submitted bids. Um, the administration is recommending a war bid to Eric Kalian Plumbing and Heating in the amount of $59,620. Um, and again, the funding for this project will be from the Building Maintenance Expenditure Trust. Um, I'll also note um, we, we believe we'll be eligible for a um, New Hampshire SAVES rebate, um, so we'll be applying for that. However, that's not a guarantee. Can I have a motion for that, please? Make a motion to award the boiler replacement bid to uh, Kalian Plumbing and Heating for the amount of $59,620. Thank you. Got a second. All in favor? Unanimous. Okay. Um, before we do personnel and non public, we will just go over the meetings upcoming. Um, the SA21 Operations Committee meeting is next Tuesday now. It's changed. Um, I do have a conflict for that, so I don't know what you would like. Will you give it to Corbett? Will you have an alternate view? Uh, ideally, we would have your, just have your alternate. Okay. okay. That would be fine. All right. Does anybody who remember the who the alternate for Operations Committee is? I'm going to look that up. Sure. Rhonda? <laughs> I don't remember who did what. It was a lot of things. A lot of things going on. I just remember that's supposed to be me. We do have a stop. Okay. Tuesday. May 16th. Tuesday, May 16th at 6 p.m. Your alternate is Jan Hubbard. Yes! <laughs> and the winner is 5.30. That's a Thursday. I was so fucking the night, so I'm 
don't personally. So don't I. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. I'm, I'll go, but Thank good you. to go. Okay. Always screwed as the author. The next <laughs> joint board meeting is May 24th. Hold the committees down. 5.30, you said, Rhonda? 5.30 yes. next okay. Tuesday, and it's at the Winnipeg. It's the Winnipeg. But it was in, like, the lecture hall versus was, the other. Right. It was going to be in the principal's conference room. Okay. Uh, we had to move it to the lecture hall, so it will be it will be done before 6.30 because we have the work cut. Guaranteed. Mm -hmm. So, hard out. Okay. Okay. Um, okay, Jordan Ford is May 24th, and then the next school board meeting is Tuesday, June 13th, which, if we get lucky, maybe we'll play a championship game that day. Just setting that out there to the universe. So I might have a hard out for that. So, so before we go into non public, the resignation actually can be done in public. Oh. Um, so, both, yeah, both of those things can? Oh, the retire. Okay, gotcha. So, we. Uh, received a letter of resignation from Jennifer Thomas, our literacy coordinator at the elementary school, and so we would like to accept that and thank her for her service. So, can we get a motion to accept that resignation with regret? I make a motion that we accept the resignation with regret for that year. Effective on June 30th. Effective on June 30th. Okay, I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Do you know this? is that we received a notice of retirement from Kathleen Della Pena, our special educator at the middle school. Um, and so again, we appreciate her service and want to bring home that you have her. Can I have a motion? I make a motion that we accept the retirement. I'm sorry, I'm trying to look for it. As noted in the packet. Effective June 30th. Well. Effective June 30th. I'll second that no, as well. <laughs> All in favor? Okay, it's unanimous. Okay. Um, so we need a motion to enter non public. Might as well, Pat. I'll make a motion to enter non public at 550. Under, RSA. Under RSA. 91A, semicolon 3, 2, A through M. All the letters never the letters. Bad numbers. <laughs> I know, except when I have to go back to school. Don't worry. Your second 